This opportunity has just been absolutely amazing. I'm loving this experience. I just enjoy every moment of it. Quiet on set. Rolling! Action! The BFI Film Academy is for 16 to 25 year olds across the UK who are interested in a career in the screen industries. The BFI Film Academy offers everything from practical hands-on courses to trainerships and mentorships and finally events and festivals. We run 50 short courses across the UK where young people can learn about the different roles in the industry and how to make a short film. We also run specialist courses where young people can really focus on a specific area such as documentary, craft skills, animation, art department, film festivals and audience development. Our labs and scene events are available UK-wide, online and in person. Labs are monthly masterclasses, panel discussions and workshops led by industry professionals. Seen are our weekly Instagram Live events hosted by the BFI Film Academy Young Programmers. They're interviews with young filmmakers, giving them a chance to promote their films and giving you a chance to learn from your filmmaking peers. Because of the Young Programmer Scheme, I've really learned what I want to do with my career and I've made the contacts and picked up the skills that I need to to do that. We run the Future Film Festival, which is the UK's largest film festival for young people. We have masterclasses, panel discussions, workshops and screenings. Making a film in general is a cool thing, but being able to show it here at BFI South Bank is just incredible. We offer mentoring schemes and an incredible opportunity to take part in our traineeship programme, where we have placed young people on films such as Star Wars, Black Widow and Bond. This opportunity means the world to all the trainees. I would not have got this opportunity if it wasn't for the BFI. Because of the BFI Film Academy, I feel like my voice matters. Without the BFI Film Academy, I would not be in the film industry at all. So thank you to the Film Academy. <laughs>
start with the foundations of this all and really lay out the the sort of timeline of 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 how it came together in terms of discovering some source material mm. thinking hey maybe there's a film in this and then seeing it through right the way to actually making the thing yeah it was um definitely a unconventional approach i think um i found the book in a bookshop where i live in margate um and the particular bookshop specialized in books for introverts and there was something about the book which stood out to me so um i picked it off the shelf and just immediately was like fascinated by the format which is a manifesto format so it's it's really direct it's really like really it's full of visual ideas you know because it's a uh, about creating this world for shy people and um i i kind of got fascinated by it i bought the book and then uh tried to track down the author hamja found him on instagram and then we met up for a coffee in soho and we just got on straight away from that initial meeting and he's really uh, excited by how the book inspires other artists and creative people to, to make work. And I think he was excited by the idea of creating a film based on the book. Um, and it was after that initial meeting, I learned more about him, more about his story and uh, what he'd been through, why he was inspired to write the book and uh thought it'd be a, an amazing topic for a documentary so that's when i went about trying to secure um funding and at the same time i'd i'd signed to black dog films as well so um it was a great project to work on with uh them for the first time they were really supportive in helping that process and holly came on board as a producer so that's sort of how it all started maybe that's a good place for you to pick up holly so sort of when you first got involved in the project what were the priorities what did you have to get sorted out to make the film a reality well firstly like obviously i love working with tom and we've uh, had a relationship as um he's basically been a music video director for so long so um when he came to me and spoke about this project I think the first thing that worried me was obviously budget and how much we're going to have to ask for because obviously Tom loves everything looking incredible and um, while we're approaching this as a documentary there was obviously a lot going on outside of the documentary setups obviously like as you can see on that clip we had this Burgess down um, so it was about basically trying to work out where our priorities lay where do we put the money in particularly and yeah, how do we go about doing that? Of course, as well, there was complications with the fact that you've got to apply and we're using a book, you know, as source material. So we had to get uh, picture licenses signed off and publishers um, agreements sorted with Hamja and um, his publisher. It went very smoothly, um, but obviously like everyone was in it together. So it was a very collaborative process from the start. Um, yeah. How did you sort of, Tom, how did you bring a sort of go about bringing what was on the page, you know, laying it out into some kind of structure for a film? Because mm. it's it's not like the film is nowhere near a script, right? No, it, I think the, the main bit I loved about the book was the, the manifesto section, which describes this nation state, this, um, Aspergistan, this place for quiet, shy and introvert people. And it's, it's you know, like manifesto, it's in, in these bullet points, in these articles of describing in beautiful detail the uh, ellipsis as the national flag. Um, the, the sound of a seashell is the national anthem. They're very visual ideas that uh, I thought would yeah, it's less of a script and more just like, how can we bring parts of these, parts of the book to life visually and intercut that in the documentary? So it was important to establish like how to transition from documentary world into this imagined dramatized world. And that's something that um, Laura helped with 
uh, the editor of the book so much because and like yeah it, it was important we did that early on so that we didn't have to keep making that like an obvious transition throughout the film and that's in that first clip you see Hamdra simply reads part of the book and we and we're sort of dropped into that world and then after that we we could be a bit more kind of flexible and abstract with it and just sort of drop bits in when they sort of um felt relevant to the the theme of the documentary but it oh. was a, it was a challenge to to create a sense of the story and we had support with that from a, a story supervisor from the, that the bfi connected us with so yeah, it took some work that helps and you mentioned there that laura was sort of key to working out how that's all going to be interspersed laura how sort of early did you get involved as editor so you i mean i tend to, to sort of I was quite far down the line. I don't know how long you guys were working on it, probably like months, at least six months or something before. Um, so yeah, when they sort of came to me, I remember we, us three, I think we were like out having a drink or something and you you were really excited about the scene that you'd um, filmed with Arlo Parks that day or just so you were just like really excited about it. Um, and then, yeah, just, it was kind of overwhelming sort of, can be overwhelming getting into it like at such a late stage because there was just so much and so many ideas so it was kind of just kind of all working out together how how we can like stitch it all together and actually what you were saying about the um transitions between normal life and the book i remember we've got their voice on it who does the voice over like the computerized voice i think we just did that as an accident we're like oh yeah we'll just put that in and then we really liked it so i think you know there's a lot of fun things in the pro in the process of just coming up with like happy accidents that work really well and that sort of makes such a difference throughout the film when you just come across something like that and we're like okay cool so maybe we can play with that a little bit more but it was um a super creative project which was um what you want you know a director to bring to you i think laura actually even like thinking back to it now i sort of really wish we got you involved way earlier on in the process just because we know now how it's like been structured but it was just like it would have helped i think so much moving forward with the pre-production obviously an editor's key to everything but um yeah it's it, you learn you know every project you do you learn so next time <laughs> we'll have you from the start <laughs> and there was a i mean you, you've really touched on it then how this is such a hybrid kind of film in terms of you, you Tom, you sort of first thought of it as a documentary, but coming from a music video background, it's got aspects of that in it, like huge aspects of that. Mm. Um, and it's got a sort of biographical aspect as well of, of, of Hamja being not just the author of the source material, but a, a real subject in this. Yeah. Um, and so um, I wanted to sort of really talk about that you maybe maybe speaking about the music video aspect of it we should watch the the clip with Arlo Parks in which then went on to become a music video in its own right so it, that, I think that demonstrates quite well how this is quite, quite far beyond a, a documentary so if we could run uh, clip three that would be really good just like an angel when I listen to that song it really makes me feel like I'm part of something larger. Mm. It's just a song that seems so universal. And I have no idea how many teenagers who are like in pain have listened to that song. You don't feel as lonely, you don't feel like an island in your suffering. You're kind of part of something bigger. But I'm a creep. But the fact that we're still singing this song makes me feel like the world's not a better place. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like, if we all got together or we performed some sort of movement together, we could yeah. make the world a better place and use that song to connect all of us. And that's something that I really resonate with. That's a goal and a project that I'd really want to be part of. You should join the Chai Resistance Movement then. I'd love to. There you go. You've got some shy radicals there organising. Yeah. Live on camera. Um, but yeah, there's a part of that which is uh, Arlo playing piano and singing, which um, is very much a music video. But then I think also in there you see the um, 
sort of realization of some of the aesthetics of Aspergistan, this fictional state that Hanja's created. Um, maybe we could talk through that a little bit because that's an interesting aspect of, of adapting source material is as a director, you're a new creative person coming in, taking something, a piece of creativity and sort of bringing it to life visually. Mm. What, what were your thoughts around that? And how do you approach it? I think that's like one of the most exciting things about the book was how it, the, the line, the sort of boundary between reality and fiction was so blurred and you could, you could we could get quite overexcited imagining you know what if this was real like what if we took this as like a real the beginning of a real movement like what if the shy resistance was building like and what would it look like and what what would those conversations be and who would you want to recruit you know and what would the what would the theme tune be these were kind of new ideas inspired by the book um that came up in conversations i had with hamja on the phone and like talking about music we liked growing up and um, a theme tune for introverts being creeped by Radiohead is a funny kind of tongue in cheek idea, but reimagined here with uh, Arlo Park's involvement and taking on a new meaning, that was something that Hamja was really excited about, definitely. Um, so it was, yeah, that was one of the most exciting ideas I think we developed and included in the film. And it, but it was important to also stay at least true to some of the source material and get that right first, build that as a foundation. And then, yeah, a couple of the ideas were, were new developments, new creative developments inspired by the book. I, I'd, love, I'd love to kind of drill into the like pure aesthetics of it as well, because you've kind of kitted people out in uniforms for this, <laughs> this new uh, regime. Yeah. Um, was, was that fun, a fun process? I think I, I'd find it really fun. <laughs> Definitely. There's this, there's, I mean, when we were having debates throughout the process of like, what would people wear in this new world? Like, you don't want to get too fashionable if it's going to be like a political movement against extroversion. Um, you know, you can, you can start having quite, uh like amusing internal debates about that like um we did we did include some sort of self-reflecting dialogue actually about like is this too radical chic you know at one point um about the use of uniforms and berets and stuff like that but it just i think that uh yeah george was george oxby was the costume designer and um we all discussed certain influences that inspired those uniforms and and the ellipsis you could see as a as a sort of emblem on uh, on, on on the uniforms was the national symbol so um yeah the aesthetic side of things obviously coming from a background in in music videos and fashion films was it's it's what i get excited about um and i think balancing that out with something that has depth is an aspiration of mine to like move forward with, with the films I make, trying to balance those things out is, is interesting. Um, Holly, I wanted to ask you maybe as a, from a producer's perspective about, you know, the different parts of the film and how some of them needed to be, look really beautiful and, and, and other parts you could shoot loads and loads and sort of intersperse it. What, was, what were the big considerations there when you had like knowing where to put the resources? I mean, we we shot one day really that I'd say was a Spurgistan, right, Tom? And then we actually we actually at the very beginning, before this even got um funding, we went out to Libyana and shot with Hamja just to uh, sort of like um I guess it was sort of like just to meet him and make sure, you know, we we sort of knew what we were doing and a bit of research. Um, and I don't know, not that much of that footage made the um, <laughs> made the edit, but we shot there for about four days. Um, and then um, we just didn't, as much as Tom would have loved to have kept shooting um, as much as possible, like every director, we only had like um, obviously limited resource to shoot one day for Spurgistan. So that was pretty much as structured, um, as structured as you can get, you know, shoot with a first AD, DOP, full crew, lighting team, art department, 
styling glam um which i think hamja really enjoyed as well and that was something to that i was gonna um actually say about tom talking about the costume is that remember this was all very collaborative ham just still had to sign off on these aspects that tom would put to him so actually it, it was quite unconventional in the way that we did that that we had obviously a contributor that was so involved in the creative process which made did make things challenging because obviously tom as a director has got you know his his um vision um but also it needs to align with what hamja Hamja, which I think made it a lot more kind of feels a lot more like I hate that word authentic, but it felt more organic when you came up with the Spurgestan because you knew he was still agreeing with what you wanted to do. So it wasn't like we just Tom just took something and made it his own, um, yeah. which felt really good. And that's why I think we were able to structure a really good shoot day around it all because everything had been signed off with Hamja beforehand, um, which made it a dream <laughs> as a producer <laughs> to get run through all those scenes um, and everything was used I think that we shot on that day because it was really thought about and also we did it at the end of a lot of our um, documentary shooting so we sort of knew what we needed to get um, to fill in the gaps and what would link well with the documentary footage that Tom had already got. I mean yeah that is definitely one of the I must in a way you say like it was sort of really rewarding having Hamja there to sort of see it uh, realized I suppose that's one of the huge things that makes this a different kind of adaptation is that how much of a uh, a central part of it Hamja is um but also you it you bio biographized it if that's not a word um but you sort of <laughs> you, you delved into Hamja's uh life uh, a lot more personally than the book itself does uh, in an attempt to explain chai radicals and where it sort of emerges from so um sort of there are there are lots of themes ar around islamophobia and things that hamish's family have dealt with um that you sort of i imagine would have thought you had to include in the film um so what would how did you make the decisions around how much of real life to include to explain Aspergistan? I think it was key to the understanding of the book and and uh, and Hamja as an artist, um, like why he wrote the book. And he experienced a really traumatic family event um, around uh, his brother being wrongfully imprisoned without trial and extradited to the US. And he ended up leading the, um, he ended up uh, basically like fighting for his brother's release over the course of many years and leading that campaign as a shy introverted person. So the book, like a lot of the ideas, although like they, they are, you know, are beautiful or amusing come from a, a real place of like deep trauma and deep emotion and like that was kind of fascinating to me um throughout just like the book was almost a manifestation of all of that experience and it was his and it was him actually returning after that period of time to what he was hoping to do before uh, he ended up leading a, a campaign um, which was art so like his he is a conceptual artist and that's uh you know he he managed to like put all of this experience into a manifesto um and so i wanted to, to obviously convey a lot of that but it was all again only as much as he was happy to share throughout so we 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 scheduled um interviews with him uh, at certain times and touched on on those moments uh, yeah. as much as he was happy to basically okay we've got a clip that i think illustrates that really well so maybe we should show that one now which is clip four my brother's case was hot headline news i had the full force of the government and media against my family trying to portray us as this demonized thing I was forced into the spotlight, which felt incredibly traumatic as an introverted person. But I felt like it was my duty to walk into these newsrooms. 
Inserting your humanity makes a world of difference. One case which has drawn strong criticism is that of Saeed Talha Assad. And my brother's been detained for without trial for some of the longest periods in um, the longest periods in British history. Hamza's work was exceptionally good. All the TVs, BBC, ITV, Russian, all the news, they came in here to take pictures of Hamza. It was a surprising, it was a, from where he got that knowledge, strength, idea, I don't know. The fight against the unjust extradition law has united people from left and right. Boris Johnson said we should be tried in the UK. Caroline Lucas did. The entire political spectrum is ludicrous to the extreme. Stand firm for justice. Stand firm against extradition. Many, many people, hundreds and hundreds of people, they helped Hamja, you know. He was our soul. That 10 years, I feel like a one night, you know. Like that, I was in a deep dark maybe, I don't know where I was, but I, I didn't count, but it passed like that. In isolation, that's a, a pretty intense clip to watch actually. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I thought was amazing about the film is that um, that's, you, you worked that in there while keeping loads of more lighthearted stuff flowing through it because I, I mean, to me, uh, that that seems like the personality of Hamza that comes across. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that there are serious issues that are very important to him, but there's also a sense of fun to it. Um, so, like, how did you how did you sort of work out a way of getting that really serious biographical chunk in there and uh, and not sort of killing some of the momentum of the film, I suppose. Yeah, I think that was really um, a challenge. I, I can't say that I was like totally clear on how that was going to work, but I knew that it was important for the reason you stated that um, it's kind of the absurdity of the situation that he'd been through and the extreme, the extremeness of it, like the, the impact that would have on someone like how how is that going to affect how you are as a person and obviously there's like so much complexity I think in um, there's so many layers to the book you can read it like in one way and if you want to like and I, I think different people have different readings of it but I, I, yeah in answer to your question I I knew it was really like going to be fun to imagine these scenes straight from the book like I wanted to know more about why Hamdra had written it and I think part of that we were uh you know his his parents were um sort of welcoming enough to to share their insights and their experience too and that was later in the filming process that we I you know I hope I'd built up enough trust with Hamdra to to have that conversation with them and see what that felt like but I, I remember actually really clearly that that particular shoot day, I didn't know how it was gonna work in the edit and Laura managed to take, I think the, the key moments of the conversation and just, you know, cause it's a, it's a lot to take in and it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of emotion to kind of process as well, like after something that's more lighthearted. So, Laura was key to that specific edit point, I think. Yeah, Laura, do you, uh, how do you remember sort of working? Yes, yeah. so that was like, I remember the day, because we, we'd already started editing before that scene got shot. And I remember when sort of the guys brought it into the edit and God, it was a really hard day, actually. We were just sort of like, just kind of in sh like it's quite sad you know thing to, to watch and we're obviously really invested in telling this story and representing everybody involved in it in the in the right way um so it was really important that we like kept that emotion in there but yeah so when, if you watch the whole film 
because what happened to his brother in in the film it becomes as a shock we what we decided was that the just the telling of that bit of the story should come in in a really like overwhelming quite shocking way um to, to sort of represent what happened to their family one day it was they were living their life and then the next day you know his brother was in prison for eight years or I can't remember exactly how many, how many years it was um but yeah like it it was also really important I think to humanize his parents and just seeing like they're just these normal kind of really sweet old people and you know they're being dragged around trying to defend something that someone's not done at all and I think just really just to show you know like islamophobia that people that to really show like these are just lovely people um and just their emotions um it was really really important to me actually that we did that yeah i can totally see how that was a really uh that was a really important decision in the edit were there any others um i mean i i feel like we've we've spoken a lot about the 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 two different parts of the film really the the sort of the just depicting Aspergistan and then the the rest of it that sort of glues it all together um as an editor what was what were your like key thoughts on how you're gonna strike that balance yeah I mean it was like it was super tough because we never knew like we tried so many different things so I think like initially what we did was we made little sections and then we just kept swapping them around until it felt right um you know and it took a long time to get exactly to where we wanted to do and I remember we tried to we tried a lot of different things so at first I was like look let's just not worry about like the visuals of it let's just put together this structure which it, it would normally be how I do it but then it just didn't make sense and then one day I think we it was like quite a like just sort of December because we were, we were editing it just before Christmas and we kind of it was like dark and cold and we just wanted to be at the pub and the Christmas parties and stuff. And then one day we just sat in a room sort of like quite like frustrated and we just came up with the, the little intro section. And I think as soon as we did that, that was a real like game changing moment for me um, of like, okay, like this is really, cause there's so many different mediums in it. There's like stock footage, there's 16 millimeters, there's, the Asperger's and drama sort of reconstruction there's footage that they shot in Ljubljana there's just so much stuff and um you know the challenge of that was was actually really fun and once we got into it we would just like try all diff different things like, I remember there's one bit where the guys had filmed or someone had filmed Belmarsh prison and we we're like putting it into the edit we were like oh it looks a bit too clean so I think we we're just in the edit suite Tom had a VHS did like camera just like recorded the screen put it in the edit and we're like yeah that looks better so it was yeah there was a lot of different like it was just it was really fun but sort of at times really challenging um edit but the best one you know it's, it's worth it isn't it when you go through that thing and then the epiphanies just start happening as you go along I mean you um you obviously uh, spent a lot of time shooting with Hamja and so there was loads of that sort of interaction stuff and interview stuff to to work out what to put in and what to leave on the sort of cutting room floor um I think just in kind of like contrast to um the sort of really serious part that we just showed a clip of I think it'd be quite good to show clip two because I think in this clip uh you get a sense of um the fact that you that this film is quite fun and um I don't know there's a bit of light-heartedness to it that clearly you would built up enough of a relationship with Hamza that it was totally fine leaving this bit in. I quite enjoy it. Fuck, I can't. Oh, fuck. Fuck you, fucking... Fuck. Okay. National flag, national anthem, cultural symbol and capital city. Article, Article 21. The flag of Asperjistan consists of a black flag punctuated thusly, dot, dot, dot. The ellipsis will be represented as three dark blue circles symbolizing silence and the depths of the ocean. The flag may be used only by citizens wishing to silently indicate their request for quiet, solitude, and personal space. The national anthem is the sound of a seashell, which may be accessed on a 24-hour basis by citizens via the holding of the shell to the ear.
there you go there's a couple of like really comic moments in there and i have to quickly jump in and say i remember when they first sort of came so we started looking through footage and it sort of made sense to look at this Burgistan stuff because it was like just a bit easier to start there and I remember on the first day being like what what is this like I don't understand at all um of just like the shell thing it just took such a long time to sort of figure out like how to do it all but um yeah it was funny and also you just saw Tom's cameo in there because he was the the guy on the beach picking up shells <laughs> brilliant um but yeah i just kind of i just think it's really revealing maybe that the bit with the flag where you can't get it to stay um tom i would you agree that that sort of is like that's you you spent enough time with him that you knew it'd be all right to to kind of slightly poke fun at him there yeah i think there was there was loads of comic moments that could have um been incorporated i i remember actually we were talking about this the other day but when Hamja first came in to review the the edit after quite a you know a long process of filming he was he was taken aback initially at like that it wasn't funny enough I think that was his initial reaction you know like he thought it was going to be funnier because there are like there is a reading of both the book which is like totally like tongue-in-cheek and more amusing and I think there was elements that maybe set a tone throughout, you know, it, it's the, you know, we start reflecting on um, mental health issues and the, the, the score, the, 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 the whole composition, the music composition is, is in minor keys and quite melancholy. And like, I feel like the, if you want to read in, like, I'm glad you found that, that, that scene amusing because I think, that might not come across with the other influences, you know, that it kind of like, it looks dark, it feels quite dark, there's dark topics, but you can hopefully find moments of light throughout. Um, yeah, we filmed these scenes, like they were set up, like the, the two guys there listening to sounds of seashells and basically like testing like which is the best sort of sound, you know, we filmed that like improvised over about 10 minutes and you know, the two of them were sort of remarking on like, which was the best seashell sound. So there could, we could have, you know, there was like, it could have been increased the amount of um, comedy that was included throughout, but I'm happy with the balance that was struck in the end. Yeah, I can see how that was a, a, a tricky one because you could sort of read, read it as a really serious manifesto and laying out of this utopian society, which must be adhered to but there's something inherently comic in any anything like that right and I can't imagine Hamja put the the shell thing in the book right just as a anything other than slightly a joke you know right it's not he 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 doesn't seem that po-faced so and as you say he said it, it could have been it could have been funnier at one point so yeah he obviously approves of of um poking fun of things like that yeah. I suppose um <laughs> Generally, now you, this after this process of adapting a, 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 a short story or no, not a short story, a book into a short film. Um, what sort of are the big lessons that you've learned? Like if you were going to pick up another book and, and say, oh, I want to make this into a film. What would you uh, how would you behave? Would you go about it in a more direct way? Would you change it? Um. I'd like to say I've like learned lessons. I, I'm sure I have, but it's difficult to tell really because I, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, Tom, it's, I reckon maybe like, you know, we hit, cause I was thinking about this. I was thinking like about the structure and how, like how we did it. Obviously it was always going to be complicated because we, we didn't know exactly how the story was going to go, but maybe, maybe if we were doing it again, I'd focus more on getting these initial beats down and yeah. having an editor, Laura, involved way more from the beginning so that we take that source material, work out what is really, really key to use from that and then use that as a structure. You know, even when, like we do for other um, films, like even creating a mood animatic or something like that, that would help us lead on to do an edit or something. That um, is daunting though, that idea I find daunting. Yeah. Really because I'm I, I like 
coming up with creative ideas like doesn't isn't that quick for, for me it's not mm-hmm. something which is like pure natural like I, I take time to reflect on things and change my mind quite a lot like I think some directors can get an idea down on paper like straight away and stick to that I don't know if they exist but it doesn't tend to I kind of like figuring things out in the process and you know like if and I know you can do that you can write down the beats at the start and get a sense of like what you want to plan to do and then you can mess around with it but I don't like even committing it to paper that's probably a problem I need to sort out but you know we wouldn't have involved Arlo Parks if that had been we'd been stripped from the beginning because like throughout I was always looking for other things to introduce like how can we involve more people in this more artists how can we make this like more complicated more stressful basically that that that's always the goal just keep getting yeah I don't know probably I know I I think it makes total sense (laughs) no it makes sense you know I've worked with you for you know years now (laughs) get completely get the process it's just um maybe it would be maybe it's a different situation if we had like I, I don't know maybe way more money or way more people involved or things like that um but you know, it was a really enjoyable process, and it did go on for a very long time. We <laughs> we were in this world for when did it? When did you start speaking to Hamza? I don't actually. I think it was over the course of a year. Was it? I Maybe it was... <laughs> from our initial conversation, and then we went through like a pitching process to get funding from the Doc Society. That takes a couple of months, and then mm-hmm. so yeah, there was there was a lot of development time, and there was. I, that that can be a danger because that's like you start to think about new ideas all the time and then you've got like just too much to play with too many exciting things and but I didn't want to make the film longer at any point it was like it was important it was digestible like rather than just think if it was going to get any longer then that would be totally essential to decide on some sort of narrative journey but shorts can be experimental and they can be um you can you know be more a bit more a bit more free with the format it could be shorter potentially to like that's one thing i think like like the full 20 minutes but maybe it could be a few minutes shorter that would have been a a tricky job for laura i imagine yeah that was was yeah no it was good length it was good length (laughs) (laughs) so i I guess maybe what you're saying is that you know I'm, i'm one of the one of the questions in the sort of blurb of this panel session is is what makes a good film adaptation but my sense is maybe that you're saying that the answer is different depending on whether it's a film adaptation that ends up being a short film or a feature film or something you know half an hour for tv or something like that you know um maybe you were freer because this was a short yeah i think um i mean i love where like within the book, you've got this, the, the, the blurred boundary between reality and fiction. And that's something I just enjoy in all, all of my work, to, in all documentary work, to, to play around with that. Um, I don't think documentaries necessarily have to be like, you know, one way. You can be experimental with some of the ideas within them. And that's what's exciting to me. You can like bring other elements of um, filmmaking into that process. So. I don't know. I think, yeah, it's so there, there definitely isn't one way of it because obviously it totally depends on like what, what sort of book you're adapting to begin with. And, you know, I think that if you, if you read the book, which I really recommend people to, to do, because it's got so much more within it, um, you can see it, it, it moves around from different styles of writing. Um, and I thought that would be fun we kind of emulated that in a way. So maybe maybe it is sort of honest to the style of the book in some respect. Yeah, that's a really good observation, actually. Um, I think it's a really hard question to answer kind of with one answer because every book is different, every director is different, every, you know, film format mm. puts something, bring, brings some kind of aspect to it which affects it. So you did it, this was the right way to approach this book for a short film Mm -hmm. um do you think there could be another way that you know somebody could have taken and made made a a full-length dramatized feature out of it yeah i mean we talked about that myself with hamja afterwards because we weren't quite 
like finished and <laughs> there was so much more that we were discussing and I know for a fact that like this is just one interpretation this is one iteration of the text and the, a lot of the work Hamza continues to do is like inspiring other interpretations of it whether that's in different formats as well different artistic formats and um yeah i think there's there's many interpretations of, of the of the book um what other sorts of books would you like would you do I, there, there are many books like shy radicals i guess so uh mm. what kind of thing would attract your attention if you're going to adapt something again i'm not entirely sure i mean I, I loved how like the style of manifesto writing is isn't something I'd really thought about before. So it was a great like, you know, they're, they're beautiful texts. They're really like how they use like rhetoric language and um, you know, how visual they can be. I think that's what made this particularly interesting. I haven't I haven't actually thought about uh, adapting another source material since, to be honest. I think just sort of go wherever my interests sort of take me throughout. And yeah, that hasn't occurred to me since, I think. Uh, yeah, it, it's not as if it's something I like, want to stick to doing, because I guess it's quite unconventional with, for a documentary to be based on a, on a book, maybe. I think it is. I, I can't think of another one. Yeah. Um, Documentaries tend to be, you know, answering a question or, you know, investigating something. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's really interesting, actually, as a point. Um, I think it, that might be why, sorry, to, I, I think maybe that's why um, it was tricky with the festival circuit as well, because, you know, I think it's a really powerful film and, and I'm really, really proud of it. I'm watching it back after so long. And um, but I think it was it might have struggled a little bit where to sit exactly because it mm. is a really you know it is strange it's unusual um, and it doesn't fit into really any category. We need to make our own film festival. Um, <laughs> that's, that's bit, Tom's wonderful and weird um, documentaries. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good point. I I think that actually the length was a challenge for film festivals too because that's yeah. something I didn't realise. You know, most shorts are either under fifteen minutes. And some of it's like, and then like medium length are like 20 or maybe shorts, they sort of increase to under 20 minutes. This was 22 and a half minutes, right? So that, that would have been a really useful bit of information if someone had sort of said, keep it under 20 minutes so you can apply for the short categories at festivals. So I ended up being in obscure categories, uh, more, mm. more so in like themed categories. So it would sit within a certain theme uh, at festivals, but saying that like it it was at some really interesting uh, festivals from australia to ireland um you know transitions festival in australia like had a really interesting program uh yeah it was screened all over the world in different places online because it was covid so um yeah great yeah yeah you didn't do yourself any favors maybe <laughs> by, by making it such a sort of eccentric film it, does, yeah. it doesn't fit into the boxes that the, the film world has built so but maybe that's why it's so brilliant so um fair enough um yeah, it's we're gonna a, bit of a shame that we didn't like well maybe we can but like have a screening of it because it's quite yeah. it's quite amazing to especially because it's such a kind of strange project just to feel be in a room and feel what what the reaction to it is i think and it worked really well within a uh, sort of an event like that's something we talked about it's not necessarily like we we talked about initially you know maybe screening it in libraries and places that resonate with shy people or introverted people or like caves or something like this like mm -hmm. and like creating an event around it a screening event that would be quite unusual with um different forms of um, I mean, like it's screened, I suppose, with Hamja's exhibitions as well in different formats. And yeah. that might sit alongside like a talk like this about the issues uh, and maybe a reading from someone or, uh, yeah, readings from the book. So I, yeah. I don't think it's, I think it's still got the potential to screen physically in places, I hope. 
that actually leads into i wanted to go into a q a um because we've got about just a bit over 10 minutes left and funnily enough hamdra has asked the question himself um so that, that is that is just about what you were just discussing so i i think maybe that'd be a good one so he says uh the film circulates between contemporary art gallery world and film festival cinema world how do you work between those two and how did that process shape the film Amdra asked that question <laughs> what, hey, <laughs> what, I, can you someone what, pretending to be Hamdra maybe <laughs> No, I think he is watching. What? What? Can you repeat that question? So it goes. So it screens within these two different top contexts. Yeah, between these, the contemporary art gallery world and the film festival cinema world. How do you work between those two? And then maybe how did that process shape the film? Did you think about that? Um, I don't know. I don't have many. I'll, I'll have to think about that. To be honest, I think like the the art gallery world isn't to be honest like a space i'm that familiar with i've 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 learned about it through um hamja's work really um going to a lot of those spaces i've never personally satisfied with how films are screened in those spaces you can barely see them on the wall and like you can't hear them a lot of the time so uh and then it hasn't screened in physical cinema so <laughs> as far as i'm aware i don't know how to navigate those two things yet but um yeah i'd be interested to find a way i guess Ham, so Ham just has looped us in with like loads and loads of people i just been great about getting out there and pushing out there and used his contacts in the art world you know and it has screened at a lot of like private you know art gallery space and stuff like that so we're very thankful for him for that because again i don't have access to like you know that world <laughs> just world, just cinema and film Mm. Totally. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? Sort of, um, I suppose, creating real world spaces in which shy and introverted people want to go. And like so many of those events are about mingling and doing things that are more suited to extroverts. Kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is a good idea. And, and um, I've noticed there is, I, I, maybe I'm more aware of these sorts of communities now since, but a friend of mine, for example, in Margate runs an event called Thought Palace, where he invites people over the course of a window of time to a space and like no one's no one talks. They just sort of like hang out together, maybe read, but like like silence is sort of the encouraged, you know, just silent reflection, being being with people, but like not, you know, and but does the idea of a film like I don't know. I think there's there's shy film clubs that we've had the film uh, screened at too. Cinemas are good places for quiet people. Yeah, true. <laughs> Very true. Um, another question that somebody asked, uh, Thomas Revington asked, uh, great film. Uh, were there any other inspirations or influences on the film, look-wise, mood or tone? It's obviously always hard to work out what you're drawing on when you sort of envision something, but yeah, it can't just purely be in the book, I guess. Yeah, a lot of the visual references, like I think Hamja and I shared a, a, an interest in 90s grunge music and Indian alternative bands from that era. So that's something we talked about a lot. Um, Jack Madison was the DOP, the cinematographer for the for the film, and uh, we had yeah, he shared some really great like cinematic references. I'm trying to think of the exact series, but it was on Netflix at the time. This is the popular. Oh, I think it's called Mind Hunter. The uh, about is it like the FBI in like the seventies. That yeah. looked amazing, that series. So that was a reference definitely for cinematography for uh, the um, Aspergistan dramatized scenes. That makes perfect sense. It's mm -hmm. always great to hear about influences and then you can watch back. So if anyone gets a chance to go to a screening, they can consider that and be like, ah, oh, yes. Yeah. I think they just make like offices look really sort of like hazy and moody like simple spaces that but well, they look really rich and 
like there's a lot of depth and mood to to uh to Mindhunter. It's great. I love that series as well. And there's a this question kind of got asked in a few different forms, I think. So it's clearly uh, sort of a burning question. Um, it's how much can you alter about the source material and still say still stay true to the author's vision and to yours? That's kind of like the difficult balance of this whole thing, really, isn't it? Mm. Well, being a documentary like and about Hamja, and it was. It was like it, it, it's really important to me to um, make sure that the like you know the contributor, the artist who you're working with, feels part of that process. And um, it we enjoyed collaborating on the creative aspects of how it was imagined. So there was always a conversation ongoing, and I, I, it would have been like the worst situation. My worst nightmare would have been like creating you know, Aspergistan, which Hamza had been imagining in his head for five years and like totally ruining it, <laughs> you know, creating a room or a space that like, it wasn't, it wasn't how he saw it in any way. So yeah, always, I, I guess it helped that I had that like direct communication with the author. Um, without that, I guess you can, you know, do whatever you want and not, you're not gonna upset anyone <laughs> necessarily. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've heard stories of when that hasn't happened, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you can upset fans, can't you? And, you know, there's Hamza, I think there's probably people that got in contact and said, that's not what Aspergistan looks like, or, you know, I didn't see it like that, but, you know, you're not going to please everyone. Sure, that's very, isn't that true? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um. And this is quite maybe a more technical one, but I think it's actually quite good. Uh, it could be helpful for people. So it's an anonymous person asks, when securing funding, how do you ensure that you retain the rights to the project? And how do you monetize your short film to satisfy your backers? There you go. It's a very specific kind of business of film question there. So the, the, I, didn't, I don't actually like, I didn't know about this stuff at all, but I, I'm trying to learn as much as I can as I go. And um, how do you satisfy the backers? In this instance, the BFI don't expect a return on the grant. It's a grant. It's not like a commercial, like there's no commercial interest. It's not like they ask for the money back afterwards. Uh, it's as far as I'm aware there to support emerging directors and support the arts and um i think there are ways i've learned since though that you can monetize your film with but it's, it depends what sort of film it is and i think once this film is out it probably sit quite well in like an educational resource for universities or for something like that where i don't know they might be teaching a course on different forms of activism or you know, topics around Islamophobia, maybe it'd be like a nice piece to introduce like some of the themes within the book and mm -hmm. that could be a form of monetizing it, but these haven't been explored. So uh, it's my first short documentary and I'm trying to learn it as I go as well. Holly, is a, you, I was going to ask Holly as a producer, maybe do you have any sort of more uh, thoughts on, on that more generally having worked with other directors as well on things like this? Yeah, so this is also a first for me as well, um, because I normally work in music video and commercial land. <laughs> so um, we get given the money and then we make what well, um, <laughs> made the creative. Yeah. Um, but absolutely, I mean, like, like Tom said, it was the grant and then um, RSA Films also put in some money. Um, we needed it. For, um, they basically matched BFI's grant. Um, and I think like with rights and things like that, I mean, again, it's just, it's always read your paperwork. <laughs> Tom and um, myself as a producer have the rights to this film because it's a grant, um, but we've got, you know, all of that was sorted out. And I 
can't tell you how much paperwork I had to do for this um, this film. I've never in my life worked on massive budget jobs and had like very minimal paperwork compared to this. But I guess it is because there's just so many people involved in it and money being put in from different places. Um, but yeah, we're gonna work at um, maybe getting some distribution, like Tom said. It's just trying to find out where that sits and how, how we do that properly. But again, we're lucky to be at RSA Films and they can support us in that because they have a massive feature film department and lots of knowledge. So we'll delve into that world once this is out for sure. Um, which leads us quite nicely into what, what I thought was probably the most pertinent question someone asked to end on really, which is, is there anywhere we're able to watch the film? <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure after this chat, there'll be some people who haven't seen it yet. Yeah, so it's actually not out right now, but um, we are. it's going to be going out on the B, BFI player. This is what um, my lovely colleague Jim is organising. Um, and also um, it will then be out and we'll release it hopefully on some, you know, cool platform. Um, so soon, next couple of weeks for sure. Yeah, watch out on all of the all the correct social channels I guess it's just been a huge delay as Tom knows like it's been a real like you know everything boring boring COVID but like we wanted to get out physically ages ago but um luckily it's meant, meant it's been able to do the rounds of the um festivals and stuff so that's been great as well awesome um well yeah hopefully everyone uh, on this session who hasn't seen it will be able to see it soon um because yeah hopefully and hopefully this has made everyone want to watch it if they haven't um, so yeah, um, thank you so much to the three of you for for uh, chatting to me. It's been really interesting to get those insights, and hopefully, it's been quite helpful to people as well who might want to do a similar thing. You know, uh, you've learned a lot from this. It's a very, very much a first uh, this film. So yeah, hopefully, that'll be some sort of um, applicable uh, yeah lessons there. So thanks very much. Um, I've just, just chimed in and just said that you can see the Arlo Parks music video creep on YouTube and everywhere. So thanks, Hamja. Thanks, Hamja. <laughs> <laughs>